Welcome to today's Harvard Business Review webinar, How to Choose and Execute the Right Strategy. I'm Julie Duvall, Marketing and Communications Director for HBR, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I want to thank Brightline Initiative for making this discussion possible. Executives are bombarded with best-selling ideas and best practices for achieving competitive advantage. But many of these ideas and practices contradict each other. Should you aim to be big or fast? Should you create a blue ocean, be adaptive, play to win, or forget about a sustainable competitive advantage altogether? In a business environment that is changing and becoming that is changing faster and becoming more uncertain and complex by the day, it's never been more important or more difficult to choose the right approach to strategy. Martin Reeves is with us today to discuss his research into designing and choosing the right strategy for your company. He will help you learn how to assess your business environment choose the right approach, and determine when and how to execute for maximum impact. Martin Reeves leads the BCG Henderson Institute worldwide and is a member of the Strategy Practices Leadership Team, as well as a senior member of the Healthcare Practice. Martin is also a member of the BCG Henderson Institute's Innovation Sounding Board, which is dedicated to supporting, inspiring, and guiding upstream innovation at BCG. He has been a fellow since 2008. Martin's research topic focuses on the future of strategy. Strategy has historically relied on concepts of scale, efficiency, and first-order capabilities. However, traditional approaches are often undermined by unpredictability and dynamism in today's business environment. Therefore, companies must supplement traditional competitive advantage with dynamic, adaptive capabilities and strategies, which is what Martin is exploring. Martin is the co-author of Your Strategy Needs a Strategy, which offers the strategy, strategy palette as a tool for enabling business leaders to tune their approach to strategy into their strategic environment. Martin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, choosing and executing the right approach to strategy. And you'll see that um, uh, actually one of the things that we're going to emphasize is the, the connectedness of uh, strategy uh, and execution. Uh, but first, uh, a word about um, uh, where the, the book Your Strategy Needs a Strategy comes from. Um, so I, I uh, lead the BCG Henderson Institute, and our mission is to uh, essentially look at the uh, ideas which um, forward-looking leaders will need uh, to shape their next game. And there's nothing more important in that respect than, uh, than, than, than strategy. And we took this on because we were uh, hearing uh, essentially confusion um, and, and stress around the role of the strategy department, around the effectiveness of the annual planning process. So we decided to uh, take a look at uh, what works, um, uh, what doesn't work, and why, and what you should use under, under what circumstances. And um, uh, one of our challenges was that we were spoiled for choice because there are actually about 120 strategy frameworks in common use. So another uh, aim of this book is, is essentially to try and clarify how those different approaches fit together and which one should use under what circumstances. So let's start at the beginning. Um, business strategy is, of course, a quite a young discipline um, in contrast to uh, military strategy, which is thousands of years old. Uh, so some of the first mentions of competitive strategy are about the late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, and uh, early into the evolution of strategy, um, essentially strategy was equated with, uh, with, with planning uh, with the idea that uh, plans can be constructed from analysis of the marketplace and the capabilities of a company, and that uh, strategic positions can be created that endure in time. And here we have some uh, quotes from one of the uh, grandfathers of strategy, Michael Porter, and you can see that he stresses uh, continuity. Uh, he stresses the idea of uh, positions, stable positions, and he asserts that they, they should, uh, if the strategy is constructed right, last a decade or more. Well, this was the very proposition uh, that we hear increasingly called into question uh, by our clients. <clears throat> so we decided to, uh, to take a look at the literature. Um, one advantage we had that the uh, founding fathers of strategy didn't have is that we could look at massive amounts of data to actually test what worked. Um, so we found, in fact, that um, there was quite a lot of skepticism of strategy coming from various quarters, which essentially gave us some hypotheses to test. So... Uh, one of them was that um, the strategy has been eclipsed by technology, and of course, traditionally, competitive strategy hasn't had a lot to say about technology. 
um, that uh, the strategy or the possibility of having a plan is killed by the uh, the speed, uh, the velocity of the business world. Um, or uh, there were some very popular um, uh, books amongst practitioners that essentially asserted that uh, execution was really where the uh, the different made the difference between a great and a mediocre company, and therefore our focus should be on uh, execution, uh, not on strategy. <clears throat> so probably the biggest question we had to answer is: Is strategy actually still uh, still relevant? And um, so we analyzed uh, uh, one of the sort of sources of evidence for the book is that we analyzed about 135,000 companies over a 65-year period and asked questions like, um, what is the difference between the performance of successful companies and unsuccessful companies? So here you see the performance of the top quartile uh, of all U.S. public companies um, compared to the bottom quartile of companies uh, with respect to their operating profitability. Um, and you can see that uh, whatever constitutes strategy, whatever constitutes the basis for doing things in a different way, is actually becoming more important, um, not, not less important. So in other words, um, uh, mirroring the uh, polarizations that we're seeing in society and uh, uh, income um, that have m been much commented on, actually there's a much less commented on phenomenon going on, which is that uh, actually there's, a, there's increasing inequality between the highest performing companies and the and the lowest performing companies. So this tells us that um, strategy is important. It doesn't tell us uh, what, uh, what, what should constitute strategy. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the key findings, uh, or one of the key questions that we looked at essentially is, um, what has changed that has made uh, planning uh, less effective and what constitutes uh, a more effective approach? In, uh, in recent years. And um, the problem is, of course, that many things have changed uh, since the early days of strategy. We have uh, globalization, uh, we have changes in uh, uh, geopolitics, we have technology, uh, we have uh, millennial values, we have connectivity, cheap computing power. Um, so actually it was, uh, it was quite challenging to, uh, to sort out these different threads of what the essential changes in the environment are that necessitate a new uh, approach to strategy. Um, we, we came down um, with a conclusion that, uh, uh, that basically one of the most important changes in the business environment was actually that the diversity of strategic environments was growing. Um, so pretty much whatever uh, macro variables you take to characterize a strategic environment, and here you see a chart where each dot represents a company, and uh, you can see market cap volatility, if you like, the unpredictability of environments, and uh, the attractiveness of each environment, revenue growth in the 60s, the 80s, and the 2000s. And you can see that the footprint of the conditions of business has massively uh, increased over time. And we saw this pattern being replicated across a variety of variables. Um, so the conclusion that we came to basically was that the, uh, the question, we were asking the wrong question, that the, the question is not uh, what approach to strategy is now relevant to today, but rather which approach should one use under which circumstances? In other words, to adopt a contingent approach to strategy. So if you stare at this chart a little, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, dots at the bottom of the chart, where there is a high degree of predictability, are gonna require a very different approach from dots at the top of the chart, uh, where you have a, a state of very high unpredictability. Similarly, uh, in, a, uh, in a declining environment, points to the left-hand side of the uh, of, of the footprint of environmental conditions are going to require a very different strategy to a very a high growth, uh, a high rate of change environment. Um, so the, uh, the a broad uh, conclusion was that one approach to strategy does not fit all circumstances. So the next problem really was to say, um, uh, what is the minimum number of uh, questions that we can ask to discriminate between different approaches required in different environments? And here we, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the key tool um, in the book, which is we call the strategy palette. And the, before I go into it, the, the basic idea of the palette um, is that it's, we need a, a tool for discriminating between different types of strategic environment and different approaches to strategy and execution. So the three axes here are unpredictability, malleability, and harshness. Um, or if I uh, put it more simply, uh, the vertical axis represents the question, uh, can I plan? And if I can plan, I should, 
And if I can't, I'd be wasting my time. So clearly, this is a, a very key determinant of the approach to strategy. Uh, the, the second um, uh, axis, the horizontal axis, is malleability. In other words, my ability to shape the environment um, rather than treating it as a given. And clearly, if I can shape my own fate, I should. Uh, but if I can't, I'd be wasting my time. Um, and then the, the third axis, harshness, is basically about um, how the uh, profitability and cash flow and growth uh, of an environment uh, reflects the harshness or the beneficence of the environment. And because if we're in a position where essentially the emphasis is on short-term survival, that's one approach to strategy. Uh, whereas if we have uh, lots, of, uh, lots of growth options, that, that's really quite a different situation. So this uh, gives rise to, um, to five approaches to strategy. And uh, in the literature, these have lots of different names. But um, uh, let, me, let me tick through those and, and say a few comments about each. So let's start off with the familiar. In environments that are stable and given and, and predictable, then we can employ uh, a planning-based approach, a classical-based approach to the strategy. Uh, analyze, plan, execute would be the algorithm here. Um, so the big news here is that um, in spite of some claims made by various authors, we definitely think that this space is not dead. It's just no longer a uh, panacea. So a good example of where uh, planning still is applicable um, is, for example, in confectionery. Um, so we have a, a case study and an interview with the CEO of the Mars company, uh, for example, in the book, um, in the chapter on classical strategy. And, uh, you know, he, he says, says basically that chocolate grows with GDP, that the key brands uh, are stable over many decades. People basically stick with their childhood brands of, uh, of chocolate and, 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 and confectionery. Um, and uh, within a reasonable margin of error, one can, um, one can in fact, uh, uh, forecast. Um, and therefore, it's all about uh, scale, economy, uh, efficiency, and uh, execution disciplines. So, uh, so Mars adopts a, a classical approach to plan uh, to, to strategy and its core business, one based upon analysis and planning. Of course, uh, that doesn't mean that things are easy for Mars because their competitors are doing the same thing. So they have a number of innovations uh, even within this classical form of strategy. For instance, one of their innovations is that they have very few people involved in the process and they submit themselves to the discipline of being able to explain their strategy to uh, anyone in the company and everyone in the company within 20 minutes. So and the reason they do that is that the strategy is not effective unless it's understood by all and, and executed. So even within this classical approach, uh, innovation is certainly uh, possible. <clears throat> um, moving to uh, increasingly exotic forms of strategy. Um, so uh, in the technology space, as represented here by Tata Consulting Services, the world's second largest IT services company, uh, they're in a doubly unpredictable business because uh, not only is it hard to forecast which technologies companies will be uh, employing, but, but actually each individual company will have a very high variance in whether it embraces the latest technologies or some, uh, uh, some traditional technologies. Um, therefore, you have two sources of unpredictability, technologies themselves and how companies use them. And that leads to the consulting services um, to conclude uh, that actually they're better off not trying to plan, but rather regarding their business as a portfolio of experiments. So every customer deployment is, in a sense, an experiment, and that experiment yields an outcome, and that outcome is either successful or unsuccessful. If it's successful, they try to codify the learnings and then scale them and apply them to, uh, to, uh, to other clients. And they do this process continuously. So this is really quite different from classical planning. It's more like an evolutionary process uh, in biology. And uh, TCS has figured out uh, a way of doing that. So we have a chapter in the book on the adaptive approach to strategy. Here, in contrast to the classical approach where the algorithm is analyze, plan, execute, the algorithm here would be vary or create variants, vary, select, select, which, select those things which work, and then scale them, and then continuously iterate in a loop uh, on that process. <clears throat> the third uh, canonical approach um, to, to, to strategy and execution is the visionary approach. And um, here, this is the approach of uh, entrepreneurs. Um, it's the approach to use in situations where the market does not yet exist. Uh, it is therefore shapeable by the, uh, by the first mover. Um, and you may uh, ask, you know, what is, what is new about this form of strategy? In one sense, nothing is new. This is what entrepreneurs have been doing for centuries. Um, 
creating a vision and then realizing that vision and then uh, scaling the resulting business model. Um, what is new, however, is that um, uh, when I began my career um, in, uh, in consulting in 1989, I was basically most of the time uh, advising large companies on how to compete with other, other large companies that were fairly similar to, to themselves. And we had these titanic decade-long battles between the number one and number two in an industry. Uh, now, more commonly, I find myself advising a large company against a, a disruption caused by a small upstart company, an entrepreneur leveraging some uh, new technology or business model. So what's new here is that large companies, too, need to uh, be able to create new spaces and disrupt themselves by creating new businesses before uh, they are disrupted by, uh, by, by upstart visionaries. So we have a chapter um, based around the uh, innovative uh, consumer a genetic testing service company, 23andMe, to illustrate uh, the, uh, the the approach to uh, execution and strategy uh, in the in the in the visionary space. Coming on to the uh, fourth approach, um, we have um, uh, what we call the shaping approach, um, which is an incredibly powerful approach. It's the approach of platforms and ecosystems. Some of the most uh, Stunning examples of success in business we see today, if we think about uh, Amazon or Alibaba or Red Hat, all of these companies essentially are cultivating an ecosystem, uh, leveraging the capabilities and assets of other companies to bring about uh, a reshaping of an industry. So it contains elements of both malleability, because they are orchestrating the ecosystem, but also elements of unpredictability, because they don't actually control or own um, uh, all of the assets. And um, th these are basically strategies of platforms, strategies of co-evolution. So the algorithm here is one of uh, creating uh, influence, of uh, cultivating an ecosystem, and of uh, co-evolving uh, with that ecosystem. And the, and the trick, of course, is to have a platform that somebody uh, wants to join. There has to be mutual benefit in, in, the, in the economics of the ecosystem. The last approach to, um, to strategy, some people may not think of as a strategy at all, but uh, literally hundreds of, hundreds of companies, hundreds of large companies are currently uh, embracing this approach to strategy, which is strategic renewal. Uh, they are avoiding redundancy or obsolescence by fixing a, uh, an obsolescent business model. And what we found about this uh, approach to strategy is that one, it's incredibly common because of the rate of change in the environment. Uh, secondly, although it may be familiar, most companies have been through this several times, uh, actually the rate of failure uh, is very high, about 75% of companies that uh, set out to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, renew or restructure um, or delay actually fail to restore their uh, profitability to, uh, to sector median returns in the, in the short and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and, and, and the medium term. And what we found here was that the, uh, the, the, biggest, the biggest cause of failure was a failure to pivot between the uh, uh, early stages of, of, of a renewal process where uh, cost reduction and, uh, uh, and, and cash flow res restoral were the, were the key, and uh, then pivoting to, uh, to, to, to growth and uh, value creation uh, in, the, in the medium term. That failure to pivot was the discriminator between successful and, uh, and unsuccessful companies. So that's the strategy palette. Uh, again, the idea is uh, know which environment uh, you are in, know what, you, what the basis of competition is, and then choose the right approach to strategy uh, accordingly. Uh, and with it comes a, a distinctive approach to execution. Um, let me explain this a couple of other ways um, to, to help the point sink home. So you can think about this. Uh, another way of thinking about this is different approaches to strategy on different timescales. So the, um, clearly one needs to fix things that are broken from the past. One, we, one needs to uh, restructure uh, obsolescent business models or to fix uh, loss-making a uh, business unit. So this is the renewal strategy. A failure to do this will essentially starve the company of, of, of cash and short-term financial viability. In the present, uh, one needs to run the cash cow business or the core, uh, the core business with uh, a lot of, generally with a lot of classical discipline um, because uh, this is the business that, uh, that, that, is, that is paying for the future. And in most large companies, it's this trio of adaptive shaping and visionary strategies, uh, which is actually underrepresented and which is the hardest for big companies to, to get their minds around. Uh, 
but let me say a couple of things about it. A, it's very different from a classical approach, and B, this is the approach to uh, to create the uh, the future the future growth options. Um, so actually, um, leveraging the uh, let's say uh, embracing the contradiction between the uh, analytical discipline of a classical strategy and the more uh, creative strategies of a, a, adapting, shaping, and visionary, uh, which you might call ambidexterity, the ability to do both is actually key to success for a, uh, for a large company. So in other words, what we're not saying is that the average large company should pick one of these approaches to strategy, but rather to pick the right approach for each, uh, for each part of the business. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see the um, the, uh, the diagrams inside each of the uh, the, the boxes here on the, on this diagram, um, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that not only is uh, each of these approaches a different approach to strategy, but it's a different approach to execution. So let's contrast classical with adaptive, for example. The classical approach begins with analysis of a market environment, uh, with creating a plan, uh, and with uh, executing that plan, which is usually stable over a period of time of one year or, uh, or five years or whatever the planning horizon might be. Uh, an adaptive approach, in contrast, um, uh, has the uh, execution algorithm of uh, experiment or create variation, selecting those variations which are successful, and then scaling up those successful variations. So let's just think for a second how different these two approaches are. Um, if we ask ourselves, what is the plan? Well, in the in the classical approach, there will be a binder called the strategic plan, and it will be one thing uh, for a business unit or a company. In the adaptive approach, there may not actually be a written plan. Uh, there may be a general direction, but the plan is constantly changing. In fact, the plan is a, uh, emerges from a population of experiments uh, and, is, and, is, and is constantly changing, as in the case of, of, of TCS. Uh, let's ask another question to just illustrate the difference between these two approaches. If we ask which comes first, the plan, the strategy, or the execution, uh, then you may say in the classical approach, of course the plan comes first because only when we have the strategy can we execute. But actually, in the case of adaptive strategy, it is the trial and error, uh, the uh, initiative taking at a, at a working level. Uh, in other words, the execution which comes first and the, uh, the strategy uh, emerges from a stream of, 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 of execution experiments. So really, these are very fundamentally different approaches to, uh, to strategy and execution. Now, if large companies um, want to uh, use the strategy palette, want to apply the right approach to strategy uh, in the right circumstances, and we can show that that is a very uh, beneficial thing to do, to do, companies that do that are, are more successful in the, uh, in the medium term, um, then there are a couple of obstacles that they, they, they bump into. Uh, in fact, there are three capabilities that they need to develop, they bump into. Um, so I'd like to say a few words about each of those. Uh, the first one is um, what you might call adaptive capability, uh, the ability to uh, undertake disciplined experimentation. Uh, another one is the what I call shaping capability, which is the ability to actually create new spaces and to shape the external environment. And the third one is the ability to adopt different approaches to strategy at the same time, uh, in different parts of the company, ambidexterity. So in terms of uh, adaptive capability, um, this is not about um, uh, 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 randomness or lack of discipline. Uh, the discipline to run a, a portfolio of business model experiments is, um, uh, ev requires every bit as much discipline as uh, classical execution, just a different, uh, a different type of discipline. It requires the discipline to understand the, envir the environment specifically to uh, specifically enough to be able to target experiments. It, uh, it, it needs the capability to be able to run a, a managed portfolio of bets. Uh, it requires the capability to run a stage gate process so that the unsuccessful bets are closed down and the resources are constantly recirculated to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to other experiments. Um, it requires the organization to stay very close to the customer because it's the, the interface with the customer that the experiments and the learnings actually take place. Um, it requires the ability to both profoundly decentralize because the initiative taking is decentralized, but also to scale knowledge and share knowledge of successful experiments across the corporation. So both, both uh, integrated and, uh, and, and decentralized. It requires a culture that actually tolerates 
uh, uh, failure in uh, individual cases, um, and values speed over accuracy since the, the strategy emerges through, uh, through continuous innovation. So um, in the words that I've used to de describe it, you can imagine uh, that that is quite challenging uh, uh, for, for the average large company uh, that, that typically runs according to a hierarchy, a set of SOPs, uh, a, uh, a prescribed planning cycle, and so on, uh, and where um, initiative taking may not be, uh, may not be uh, sufficiently rewarded. But nevertheless, the example of Tata Consulting Services and other examples in the book show that uh, it's necessary in some situations and, and entirely possible. Let me say a few words about the second capability, which is typically a bottleneck for large corporations, the ability to shape <clears throat> the environment. Um, one might think logically that the largest companies with the most educated resources, with the most political influence, with uh, the, the, uh, uh, the best financial positions, uh, with the scale to buffer change, are in the best position to, uh, to shape the environment. Uh, but of course, we all know that that in practice is not the case. It's the it's the mavericks on the edge of an industry uh, that have no choice uh, but to challenge the status quo that actually, um, in the vast majority of cases, end up uh, re 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 reshaping industries. So um, how do we have uh, large companies uh, achieve their, uh, fully deploy their potential influence and, and get on top of this capability of, 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 of shaping the environment? Um, well, one way is to, uh, to really start thinking um, to change the unit of analysis, to start thinking about mutualistic ecosystems and not just the company versus its, its customers or the environment. One needs to think hard about mutual benefit for those, uh, for the, for those purposes. Uh, one needs to think about innovation, not only in terms of products, but in terms of services and platforms. One needs to think about what it takes to be an orchestrator. The key question for anyone running an ecosystem is, why would anyone want to join my club? And there has to be some benefit in terms of a brand or risk mitigation um, or systems cost um, or cost of accessing customers uh, or the ecosystem doesn't make sense. Um, one needs to be comfortable with, uh, if one is running an ecosystem, with not controlling all variables because the complexity would, be, would make that impossible. And in any case, it would undermine the, uh, the idea of a, of a co-evolving system, a system where everything is constantly in motion. Um, so often when uh, large companies try to uh, actually run their businesses as ecosystems, uh, they, uh, they mistakenly try to uh, control, uh, control all of the variables. Um, so the, uh, the irony is that many of the companies that are uh, successfully run platform businesses have a what, it, what you might call a slightly non-managerial culture. In other words, they know when to trust a marketplace mechanism and when to trust a managerial mechanism, and they tend to keep managerial mechanisms away from marketplaces because marketplaces are self-organizing. So that's a little bit about the, uh, the shaping capability. So let me say next about this third capability that's, uh, that's, that's very important. <clears throat> um, so here we see different uh, performance horizons, and uh, you see the blue circle here um, is, uh, represents current performance. So what most companies measure most of the time is their current productivity or their current financial results. Uh, so, and they measure those using you know, backward-looking objective financial uh, accounting measures. And of course, performance is very important because today's performance pays for tomorrow's growth. <clears throat> and then we have uh, the green circle on the right, which you might call vitality, which is <clears throat> excuse me, the ability to generate future growth options uh, through, uh, through innovation. Um, and uh, companies tend not to have uh, very good uh, metrics uh, for this. Um, but um, uh, we recently actually, uh, since the publication of the book uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, uh, published a new ind index together with Fortune called the Fortune Future 50. And the idea was that in contrast to most indices, which are uh, or rankings, which are based upon either reputation or financial performance. We tried to create a ranking that was based on future performance potential, one that was based upon the ability to generate future growth uh, or, or innovation. Um, so uh, relate this back to the, uh, that trio of three styles uh, in relation to the future in the, uh, in, the, in the strategy palette, the adaptive approach, the shaping approach, and the visionary approach. So coming to ambidexterity then, what ambidexterity means um, is can you do both of those things at the same time? 
can you run and reinvent the company at the same time? And interestingly, um, when we looked at uh, how many companies can do that, how many companies can run and reinvent the, the, the business with advantage at the same time, we found that it was about 3%, that by coincidence is about the same, the same proportion of the human population that can actually write fluently with, with both hands, hence we called it uh, uh, ambidexterity. Um, it's rare, it's hard, because it involves a contradiction, but some companies can do it, and it's worth between six to eight percentage points of total shareholder return uh, in, the, uh, in, in the long term, and clearly, logically, it's necessary for, uh, for longevity and long-term survival. <clears throat> um, a, few words about, a few more words about ambidexterity. Um, so we asked ourselves, um, how can companies uh, in practice uh, conquer this, this, this tough, prob tough problem of ambidexterity, the ability to run and reinvent the business at the same time? And by the way, this was a, a very common theme in all of the CEO interviews that we did for the book, the, the desirability of doing this. Not everybody used the word ambidexterity. Um, uh, one CEO that we spoke to called it mixed messages, but essentially they mean the same thing, the ability to run and reinvent the business at the same time. And what we found was that um, we didn't find a single company that had uh, enough ambidextrous talent such that all teams individually could run and reinvent the business. Uh, but what we found was that um, some of the companies we spoke to had different organizational fixes for this, for this lack of ambidextrous uh, talent, this insufficiency of ambidextrous talent. Um, and we actually found four approaches that they used to, uh, to, to, to produce ambidexterity. Um, one of them is, um, uh, is, is, is quite a common philosophy, maybe the, the most common one, which is separation, the, illustrated by the green here. In other words, they separate uh, the old way of doing things from the new way of doing things. And this goes right back to Lockheed Martin and the, uh, and the idea of the skunk works, um, uh, where uh, years ago Lockheed Martin tried to produce uh, an advanced jet fighter in the same facility as a, uh, as a commodity uh, uh, bomber. And uh, the idea was separate them uh, into different buildings with different cultures, different operating procedures. And that's one approach to, to ambidexterity. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work because it, it, it's sometimes the case that the uh, the new and the old are interconnected, or or the old or the new becomes old very quickly, um, so that a separation approach would constantly being uh, would, would would be constantly need to be sort of merged and then separated and merged and then and then separated. So in these cases, we see another approach is uh, what we call the switching approach, where you actually have multi-skill teams. Essentially, you have accountants and poets. Uh, in the same teams uh, so that you can actually do uh, creative work uh, uh, and, and also disciplined uh, classical work in the same teams. And the, this mixed skill team actually changes its emphasis as the product life cycle of the product proceeds. And a good example of that is the, uh, is the glass manufacturer uh, uh, Corning. <clears throat> a, a third philosophy, which um, uh, for some reason, um, most of the examples we could find are actually with Chinese companies, uh, is, is what you might call an internal ecosystem, uh, whereby uh, you have many, many different business units and, and hire the world's largest white goods company as an example. They have around 2,000 micro business units, and each unit uh, is uh, able to choose its own approach to strategy and execution. And the role of the, uh, the management, the role of the corporate is to create a marketplace for these companies to transact with each other and buy services from each other. So this permits, permits tremendous diversity and a sort of an, an emergent uh, structure uh, in an internal ecosystem. Um, still quite rare. There are only a handful of companies I can find that are doing this, but this is a third approach. And the fourth approach, which is now quite common, is the external uh, ecosystem, <clears throat> whereby uh, you actually have um, uh, a number of um, collaborating companies, it could be hundreds of companies, uh, which actually constitute your supply of uh, R&D or your supply of hardware or your supply of software, and you're tapping into their different approaches to strategy and execution, and uh, you uh, basically uh, orchestrate that, that ecosystem. So we have many examples of this. <clears throat> Apple is a classical one. And um, <clears throat> uh, in, in fact, um, there's a very interesting memo, um, which is the uh, internal uh, diagnosis of, of Nokia as, as to how they were beaten by a company that could never make a smartphone before. 
and uh, the conclusion of this memo, which is which is now freely publicly available, is essentially that <clears throat> it's the wrong question. Apple did not beat Nokia. Uh, Apple and a self-organizing ecosystem, two ecosystems, in fact, a hardware and a software ecosystem, beat the monolith of Nokia in the smartphone market in, in, in four and a half years <clears throat> by being able to adopt different approaches uh, in, in, uh, in each supplier, um, uh, different approaches to strategy and execution. So those are four different approaches to ambidexterity. <clears throat> Lastly, let me say a few words about um, uh, leadership and then also what happened beyond the book. So the, we didn't set out to write a book on leadership, um, but inevitably uh, we bumped into the question, how do you lead an ambidextrous company? If, you're, if your company is choosing the right approach to strategy and execution in each business, um, and if you've mastered the capabilities uh, to do that, and you've even mastered ambidexterity, you can reinvent the business in one part of the business and run the business in another part of the business, you need to lead, somebody needs to lead that, uh, that very complex organization. And so this leads to the question, how can you be an ambidextrous leader? And across a series of interviews with CEOs that we did for the book, we distilled these eight signature behaviors of an ambidextrous leader. And let me just pull out uh, one or two because they're described in detail in the book. <clears throat> so one very important one is what we call the antenna function, uh, namely that large companies, and we can measure this, tend to become very, very introverted. They become cut off from the environment because most of their attention goes to internal uh, coordination and most of their beliefs essentially are self-perpetuating internal beliefs. In order to adapt <clears throat> to a changing environment, one needs to be very externally focused, and it's really the leader that is either the direct antenna or ensures that the uh, large company resists this uh, gravity of introversion and actually keeps its attention uh, externally oriented. <clears throat> a, um, uh, number five, let me make a few comments on that. So the, the CEOs that we interviewed all stress that um, sensible organizations employing smart people tend to migrate in the right direction over time. So it's not that there are hundreds of companies out there that are not fearing disruption and not trying to do some of the things I'm talking about. It's just that they're unable to do so promptly and cleanly. And cleanly. So this is what the CEOs that we work with describe as the accelerator role, which is uh, taking the, uh, the natural intelligence of organizations about uh, their, their self-awareness about what they need to do and just making it happen faster and more cleanly and more substantively uh, than would otherwise, that would otherwise be the case. Um, and then we have um, uh, number eight, which is the uh, disruptor. Um, so it, it's sort of logically obvious that one of the few ways of avoiding being disrupted is to actually disrupt. I mean, there are some circumstances where you can protect yourself against disruption, but really when somebody has employed a technology to come up with a new business model which is superior to the incumbent model, you've, your choice is essentially a choice of timing, namely, do you wait for disruption or do you preemptively disrupt and put yourself in a position of control? And one thing that uh, our evidence shows companies are, large companies are phenomenally bad at is preemptively disrupting themselves. So this really can only come from the, uh, the leadership, the ambidextrous leadership, because uh, this really goes against the grain of the, of the, of the conservatism of a, of, a, of a large company. <clears throat> um, let me um, go quickly over this one because I'd like to wrap up and give some time for questions. Um, so another skill of the adaptive leader was number seven, which is leading not with instructions. And of course, unless you're in a classical environment, or a renewal environment, you can't really have instructions because you're dealing with unpredictable environments and, and leading, with, uh, leading with questions. And here on the slide, you can see the very different sort of questions that, um, that CEOs would ask uh, in each of these different uh, strategic environments. Um, and there's a, there's a big emphasis in the book on what are those questions? What are the right questions to ask under what, what circumstances? And how do you lead with questions? But I'm gonna have to skip over that in the interest of time. So let me wrap up with a few words on um, what has happened since the book. <clears throat> um, so we are not uh, uh, academics, uh, we are uh, practitioners. Um, so all of this was uh, uh, done with the hope that it would be embraced uh, and, 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 and help our clients. Um, so we've, uh, we did a number of things that I wanna to touch on. So um, if you go on um, at the Android store or the iTunes store, you'll see that there's a game called Your Strategy Needs a Strategy, one word. Um, 
And the game is, if you like, a practical accompaniment, accompaniment to the book. Uh, we designed it because we found that intellectual understanding of the ideas that we're talking about here is not sufficient to implement them. You need to build the muscle memory. So we built actually a video game to give managers the feel for what is it like to, uh, to actually implement an adaptive strategy. And what we found, in fact, is that it's a really good way of learning the intuitions of each of these different styles. In fact, there's a whole bunch of other assets, many of which are publicly available that you can also look at, uh, which, uh, which would help a company to implement, um, uh, implement these things. There's obviously the book, uh, there's a TED Talk, there's an HBR article, there is the, uh, the, the app I just referred to, uh, the iPad game, in other words. Um, there is an, an, uh, an e-course um, available. Um, we're working with um, a number of business schools um, to actually make this either a large part or a small part of their strategy course. Um, we've, um, uh, we're about to uh, release a competition variant on the, uh, on the game app. Um, we've tested it uh, thoroughly internally, so we can now run uh, massive parallel strategy competitions, um, which are a really good way of giving a large group of people, uh, before you set out on a st strategy change exercise, the, uh, the, the intuitions and the vocabulary to be thinking about these things. And finally, um, let me tell you about the future. So what we're doing next is, um, what we found is that, um, as I referred to earlier, um, individuals are not ambidextrous. Um, when you have them play the game, they actually show a very strong preference for a particular style of strategy. Now, the good news is that everybody learns in every style over time, but people display very strong tendencies. And um, in our interviews, we found that Choosing the right person for the right job was a real dilemma facing CEOs and HR departments. Who do you put in charge of the new disruptive experiment? What do you look for? So we're teaming up with an, uh, an, an AI and uh, cognitive testing company called Pymetrics, uh, a startup coming out of MIT. And what we're doing is we're using the game data and some uh, neuroscience tests to actually create strategic personality types and we've already piloted this, we haven't released it as a product yet, but we will be doing so shortly, um, uh, to, to create these uh, personality, if you like, archetypes, or more, more strictly, let's say, uh, neuroscience types, so that you can actually tell after doing a short test or a period of gameplay, which manager would be best off to lead an ecosystem strategy, which manager would be best off leading uh, a, a renewal strategy. And we found it considerably more accurate than, say, Myers-Briggs or some of the other tools that are uh, often uh, used uh, for this purpose. Um, so uh, in summary, um, you know, uh, what would be the implications of some of this for companies? What we're saying is choose the right approach to strategy in the right environment. Um, we're saying learn how to de deploy different styles in different parts. We're saying become an ambidextrous, uh, uh, an ambidextrous leader. And we're saying build the capabilities that would enable, would enable you to do that. And this last slide is just really some practical imperatives that come out of um, uh, about uh, how, to, how to do those things. Um, so that brings me to time. Let me uh, pause there and maybe take any questions or comments that people have. That's great, Martin. Lots of questions coming in. Great presentation. Um, the first one, and this is a question I have as well, um, when you're starting out and defining and implementing a strategy, what time period should people be thinking at with the world moving so fast? Is it realistic to consider a three-year plan, five-year plan, or does it depend on the type of strategy you're going after? Well, I think the simple, um, simple reply would be, um, number one, look at all time scales. And so that, that three-slice diagram I gave you, I think that's one simple way of looking at this. You know, do fix the things that are obsolescent in your business, the, the broken business models. Um, because otherwise they will hemorrhage cash and attention. Um, uh, do, do think about um, uh, overperforming in the core business in the present, and do think about uh, future growth options. Now, how fast should you do that? Um, uh, I think you should match the clock speed of your environment. So I think it's very important to look at the, uh, the rate of change of, um, of business models and the environment and make sure that you're matched with that. And the trick, I think, is not to focus on your nearest competitors, because other big companies like you may actually have a clock speed which is too slow. So look to the mavericks on the edge of your industry uh, for, the, for the rate of change. Um, I think the, emphasis, the, the other thing I'd say is that the emphasis is on speed, um, and necessarily so, because things are happening faster. We can, we can actually measure how fast. It's on average across all 
um, public companies, it's twice as fast, but it's considerably faster in, in technology uh, than, in, um, than in some other industries. Um, but uh, don't forget about the slow, because the average uh, age at death of a public company has come down from something like 30, uh, sorry, uh, 70 years to about 34 years in recent years. And so there are some very important slow processes, too, that need to be taken into account. For example, the cultivation of talent is a, uh, is, is a, is, is a slow process. Actually, building marketplaces is a relatively slow, it's a, it's a multi-year process. Um, so you really need to focus on all time scales. Great. Um, a lot of people are chiming in about um, culture as one of the, the yeah. biggest barriers to embarking on a, a new strategy. Do you have any advice there for how to lead um, a cultural change? Right. Um, well, culture is really important, and and um, uh, you know I often illustrate this with 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 a question. You know, how would you supposing you wanted to do an adaptive uh, uh, strategy, and you uh, you put it, you put in place the processes, you hired the right people, you had decentralized innovation, you had portfolio discipline. You know, and the question is, if you wanted to kill that instantly in the simplest possible way, how would you do so? And the answer, of course, is to punish failure. You know, if you visibly punish failure and create fear, there will be no experimentation. So I think this illustrates the, the importance of, um, of, 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 of culture. We didn't have time to go too deeply into that, but, uh, but, e but each of these uh, styles has a, uh, has, a, uh, has a culture associated with it. Now that gives rise to a problem, which is if you're trying to master ambient dexterity, can you really have different cultures in different parts of the company? Well, under separation, a separation methodology, um, you, uh, you, you can. And, and if you're using an external ecosystem, you can. You can employ some extremely conservative companies. You can employ some, some, some very entrepreneurial companies. Uh, you can do that. Um, but if, you, if you're trying to actually have an ambidextrous culture, then you really, which, and some companies are really trying to do that, uh, then you really need to legitimize uh, embracing contradiction, embracing dynamism, so that the organization really does understand that in the core business, we need to overperform and we need to take risk in the, uh, in the peripheral businesses. And although this is an apparent contradiction, uh, this is what we do. So there's an amusing anecdote in the book, actually, about one CEO that says, uh, somebody says to the CEO, you're giving me mixed messages. One minute you're telling me to be very disciplined with every penny, and the next you're telling me to be risky and creative. You know, I'm, I'm confused by the mixed, mis mixed messages. And the CEO's response is, uh, that's what I'm paying you for, to to actually create a culture of mixed messages. That's what, that's what leaders do now. It's called ambidextrous leadership. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it is indeed a very, very critical area. So um, sort of related, um, somebody had a question around um, dual strategy um, and if there's an example of a company where one part of the business was executing against a classical approach where another part of the business was focusing on the adaptive approach. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, we give the example in the book of um, uh, PepsiCo, so I, you know, since it's public, I can talk about it. Um, <clears throat> so um, PepsiCo's, uh, the PepsiCo CEO's um, response to strategy is, uh, sorry, response to ad ad um, ambidexterity is to have competing teams inside each business. Um, so in other words, um, to take one of their business units, there'll be a run the business team, and there'll be a reinvent the business team, and their she is trying to keep the teams fighting to, to preserve the contradiction because out of the contradiction will come the balance between performance of the current business and it being replaced um, by, uh, by something better. So, so in each of Pepsi's businesses, you have this, this contradiction. Another example would be, would be the classical example of Lockheed Martin. Another example, I can't give the name of the company, but would be a, a major telecoms company that has a very uh, you know, multi-decade NPVs for their fixed line telecoms business. Um, runs their mobile business in a different way, and then runs their over-the-top services businesses um, in a very sort of Silicon Valley-like way, and they use the separation philosophy to do so. So this is, I think, a necessity for almost every large business that I uh, that I looked at. I mean, change is faster in some businesses than others, but this run reinvent tension is now, I think, present in every business. Great. Somebody uh, was asking about the relation, uh, the differences and similarities between testing and executing. Uh, can, can you say a little more? Sure. Oh, I, I, so I, 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 go ahead. 
Well, let, let me let me maybe uh, let me maybe guess. Um, so I, I guess you're referring to the the tension between deductive approaches and, and empirical approaches. Do you think that's the sense of the question, Julie? I think so. Yes. Yeah. So so um, I think a um, so this varies very much between the different approaches to strategies. So the a, a classical approach is one that's, that's biases towards analysis and and uh, and deduction and you know decomposition of a plan into its components um, and those things don't change very much over time. Uh, whereas um, an adaptive strategy biases very much towards trial and error. In other words, the assumption is not that uh, if you analyze a lot of data, it will tell you exactly what to do and that thing that you need to do will will not change over time. The bias is towards, uh, for instance, the uh, there's this term minimum viable product. In other words, get into market, the market with roughly the right thing, you know, see what happens and then move very quickly to fix it and fix it and fix it again. So it's what the software industry talks about, you know, version 1.1, version 1.2. So the bias is towards action, uh, not perfection, and towards speed rather than accuracy. So uh, this, this really, uh, this is one of those dimensions that, that, that differs uh, very much between the uh, the different approaches to, to to strategy. In fact, there's a there's a table in the book that um, that actually uh, in in the first chapter that um, distinguishes between um, all of these different um, facets of a company that hinge upon the, uh, the the approach to strategy adopted. So the approach to innovation changes, the approach to execution changes, the approach to culture changes, the approach to measurement changes, the the, the trade-off between accuracy and speed changes. Um, so that's where the the power and also the challenge of the, of the approach comes in to change all those things uh, coherently. And that is ultimately why we called the book How to Choose and Execute the Right Approach. Um, it's, it's, it's actually about strategy uh, and execution and their coherence, not just about strategy. Um, here's a really good question. I imagine a lot of big companies face this, but um, what are some suggestions for ambidextrous leaders that are trying to navigate internal resistance and fatigue? Um, so maybe they're not as fast to getting up to speed and on board with a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, that I think is um, one of the one of the classic obstacles to doing um, uh, all of what we've been talking about. It's the you know how to make the elephant dance and uh, and I guess the hints, um, you know, there are whole books that have been written on that subject, but the, but the hints that we picked up from our research, I mean, one of them is that that is indeed one of the critical roles of leadership. That was the uh, disruptor um, uh, role in the eight roles. Um, uh, I think another one is um, is, is, is acceleration, um, just to, you know, constantly try to compress the, the, the timelines and make what will happen naturally happen faster with with less disruptive cost to the company I think another one is to remove um, to remove obstacles so not as part of the book but separately from the book we recently carried out some research on successful transformations and we found that um, uh, leadership change um, a actually improves um, statistically improves the odds of, of success in, uh, uh, in in transformation transformation is renewal in our framework so it's just one of the five but I, I would expect that it would apply more generally sometimes you have to Sometimes the active resistance or just the the mental of inertia of lead, the, 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 lead, the members of the leadership team that have been successful under one regime uh, is the obstacle to the to the next. So that's where the CEO has to have courage to uh, to, 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 to to swap out the the team as necessary. Another one is simplifying the problem. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's any company in the world that could do. Uh, that could be ambidextrous in all aspects in all. Uh, in, in all parts of the business simultaneously. But the good news is you don't really need to do that. So if you look at any particular business, it usually crunches down to something much simpler. It usually, in my experience, crunches down to a three-part problem. You know, one part is, um, uh, you know, what is, what is surplus to requirements or needs fixing? That's your renewal agenda. You know, how do you um, run the, uh, the, how do you overperform in the core business, which is usually the familiar part of the, uh, the equation, and then, how do you create sufficiently a sufficient number of sufficiently large bets in the in those trio of uh, creative uh, strategy styles that I talked about? Um, uh, so, so actually, um, if you look at it that way, you've, you've you've simplified many possibilities down to sort of three slices. So simplification, I think, is part of the part of the recipe too. Great. 
Um, there's a question coming in. Um, it's sort of forward thinking. Um, he's wondering if you've seen this being played out and how people are hiring leaders and executives. I mean, I, especially um, with the personality uh, part of your presentation, do you see this becoming part of um, onboarding and applicant selection? Um, well, our partner, um, Pymetrics, um, uh, that's their main business, actually, to apply neuroscience, um, which is different from psychology. Neu neuroscience doesn't measure your perceptions of yourself. It actually measures your behaviors um, so that they have some games whereby you measure your reaction speed or propensity to be distracted and this sort of thing. It's actual behavior. So they have a series of neuroscience games, and they also have some artificial intelligence that actually matches behaviors to uh, likelihood of success in different job families. Um, so uh, they have a whole business based around, around, around this doing precisely that, and their vision of the future would be that, uh, indeed, that's the way that we'll be uh, uh, hiring people uh, moving into the future. Um, Martin, you have some experience in healthcare. Um, do you see this? How do you see this playing out in healthcare companies and businesses? Um, well, I think highly regulated businesses and very technically complicated businesses like healthcare are often often think that they are different. Um, and and it is true that highly regulated businesses often uh, change uh, change more slowly because you just have less freedom to uh, for, for for maneuver. Uh, but I'd say I see. You know, our, our framework was was you know based upon evidence across all industries, and I think we see it as being quite uh, quite universal. And um, a good example of that is uh, the example I gave of the of, of the visionary company um, uh, Twenty Three and Me. So Twenty Three and Me is this um, uh, innovation whereby you take e-commerce technology and you uh, uh, you put it together with genetic testing, uh, and you Put it in a, a sort of a two-sided business model, whereby the the tests are uh, administered very cheaply. It's just a saliva sample, and it costs a hundred dollars, I think. Um, uh, and then, but then you have the the value of the anonymized data that results from that, which which has uh, which 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 has another market. Um, so probably uh, going back five years, uh, you know, the uh, I imagine that the beliefs of the industry would were that this would be um, you know, illegal, immoral, technically impossible, and economically infeasible. Um, uh, and there have been some regulatory issues around around the business, but but nevertheless, even in a very regulated, complicated business with high barriers to entry like healthcare, we are seeing uh, this sort of disruptive innovation. So so the short answer would be it applies every bit as much, maybe just on a slightly slower time scale to some other businesses. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, so under the leadership uh, capabilities, um, somebody has a question around the role of the team coach. Mm -hmm. Could you talk right. a little bit so about the idea that? So the idea of the team coach role is that um, you're never going to have enough ambidextrous capabilities. It's, it's never going to be the case that you, you have um, you know, a huge population of entrepreneurs and a population of planners and, and all of those other things that you need in an ideal circumstance. Um, so uh, I talked about the organizational workarounds for that, um, but there are the coach role refers to the, uh, if you like, to the training workarounds. So you can at least make sure that um, you have, for instance, um, what the Japanese call a horizontal fast track. Um, so in other words, you can give people early in their careers an experience of uh, each of these approaches to strategy by rotating them through different parts of the business and make them uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, ambidextrous. Um, you can also make sure that people are selected for mission critical roles. That the right, you know, the right people are selected, as 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 as, 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 as we've just been discussing. And you can also make sure that um, that teams are operating effectively if you're using uh, that that switching approach that I suggested. Uh, in other words, they're able to work with uh, strategic personality profiles that are different from their own. So if you have teams that are mixed. Um, uh, sort of, you know, disciplined implementers and and and, and creative experimenters uh, that that actually um, you can you know you can do teaming exercises to make sure that uh, that that works rather than falls falls, falls apart. So uh, there's a there's a lot that um, there's a lot of ways in which the 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 HR function becomes actually very strategic um, uh, if if you implement the model we've been talking about today. Great, Martin. This has been a great presentation, but I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank all of you for joining us.
and thank Brightline Initiative for making this discussion possible. This concludes our presentation. Have a great day.